Hi, I'm Benjamin Van Doren, a postdoctoral associate at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York, where I study birds and their migrations. Today on Socratic Studios, we'll be covering light pollution and how it impacts the billions of migratory birds that cross the planet each year and route between their breeding and wintering grounds. In the United States, around three to four billion birds migrate through each spring and fall, and most do so almost exclusively at night. They navigate by way of the stars, the landscape, and the Earth's magnetic field, and artificial lights on the ground can unfortunately disrupt their journeys. Thank you, Dr. Van Doren, for that introduction. Um, so could you expand uh, a bit more on the effect that light pollution has on migratory birds? Sure. Um, so scientists have known for for a while that light pollution can sometimes dramatically affect bird migration. This goes back to even the 1800s, especially um, examples at um, lighthouses, for example, um, where uh, records of, of mass mortality events of birds colliding um, with lighthouses that were lit up, especially in storms. Um, and uh, it turns out that migrating birds are frequently attracted to and disoriented by lights on the ground. And this puts them at risk to collide with, with lit structures ranging from buildings to communication towers um, to even uh, houses um, and, and lots of other structures. So um, estimates range that building collisions kill hundreds of millions of birds each year in the U.S. alone. So it's a, a substantial problem. Um, but more than that, light pollution can have other effects beyond collisions. Um, they can draw birds into um, sometimes unfavorable areas, um, especially urban areas with lots of light. Um, birds that are migrating overhead may be attracted to those lights and end up in an area where there's not um, very good habitat. Um, so this poses risks to them, as as well as uh, often results in them wasting energy on their migration. So it's a range of, of influences that light pollution can have on birds. Unfortunately, uh, most of them are negative. Uh, so just curious, why does the, the light attract the birds? That's a great question. And actually one that scientists really aren't sure about. Um, so I can't really answer that question, unfortunately, but it's, um, yeah, it's something that happens. It's it's potentially similar to, you know, moths being drawn to, to a lamp, um, but it, it's probably something really fundamental and scientists don't really understand the, the cognitive or, or sensory mechanisms that, that result in, in this phenomenon, actually. Are, are there any um, like thoughts that you have on the subject? Maybe not um, something like a scientific hypothesis, but just like a personal uh, explanation? I don't know. It's, it's really hard to know what it's like to be a bird. <laughs> um, I guess one, one can differentiate between birds being... Um, attracted to lights or disoriented by lights or, or maybe both. And th those are, are different possible, um, th those have different possible underlying mechanisms. If a bird is just, um, if it's migrating at night, it, you know, th these birds didn't evolve to, um, to see lights on the ground, you know, when they, uh, you know, have undertaken their migrations for, for thousands and thousands of years, you know, the only lights, um, at night are, are from above, either the, the stars, the moon. Um, and so there's just something about um, these lights on the ground that that override that that programming, if you will. Um, but I, I really don't know what it might be. But I hope we can, um, you know, in, in the coming decades, shed some more light on it. Sure. So um, because of the, the profound effect that light pollution has on, on birds, by dimming our lights at night, how many birds can we save? Well, um, yeah, that, that's also a difficult question to answer. But uh, our study that that um, we published recently looked specifically at light pollution at a convention center in Chicago. 
And Chicago is um, a city, a big city that uh, emits a lot of light. And some of our previous research showed that Chicago, um, we actually ranked it first for the city that is likely to expose the most light to the most migratory birds migrating at night. Um, so we focused on that city in our study. Um, and this convention center that that we, we looked at uh, sits on the, the lake shore of, of Lake Michigan um, at the edge of Chicago. Um, and since about 1978, this building has been monitored for bird collisions by um, a team of researchers led by Dave Willard at the Field Museum. And they've collected 40,000 dead birds over those years from this one building. Um, and so our research looked at specifically the period from 2000 to 2020 to, to understand um, how light specifically influences birds and and uh, predict if some lights were to be turned off, how many birds we might save, to your question specifically. Um, so on average, 75% of the windows in this building are illuminated from within on, on a given night. Um, and we predicted, or our statistical models estimated, uh, that if we reduced this to 50%, so if half the lights were were on instead of, or half the windows were illuminated uh, instead of a full 100%, that we could prevent over 50% of those deaths. Um, but conversely, it could be worse. So if 100% uh, of the windows were illuminated all the time, we predicted that 75% more birds would likely have died over the that twenty one year period. Um, of course, this is only one building. Um, we hope that it's a representative building, um, or or the conclusions are representative from what we could expect among other buildings. But that is a potential limitation of the study that it's only at this one building. Um, but we do see similar responses to light pollution in, in other places. This has been documented uh, across. The United States across North America, um, and I think our study is one of the most detailed to to um, or one of the most a study that gives a, a really detailed pr presents a really detailed analysis of of the um, specific specific uh, causal relationship between light pollution and bird collisions. So that gives us some confidence in our ability to to mitigate those collisions, to make a difference by, by changing behavior and, re and reducing lights. So uh, could you expand a bit more on your statistical model, um, how you formulated it, and um, sort of why it gave you the results that it did? Our analysis looked at several potentially important factors uh, to understand which ones are most closely associated with bird collisions. Um, so our statistical model included the number of bird collisions per night, as a, an explanatory variable that the model was, was attempting to, um, to explain. And we had a number of predictor variables that the model was um, attempting to relate to that response variable, to the number of collisions. So those predictors included um, things like weather conditions, including the winds, cloud cover, and visibility, um, also the, the moon illumination, how bright the moon was. Um, we included information on which windows in the building had lights on and, and how many windows were illuminated. And we included information about the number of birds migrating overhead uh, on that particular night over Chicago. And we measured that using a nearby Doppler weather radar. Um, these radars are, are big um, machines that the National Weather Service of the United States uses to, to track storms, pre precipitation, all kinds of weather. Um, but these actually give us insight into bird migration as well. And that's a whole, um, that could be a whole other episode. But uh, we used information on bird migration from the radar. And um, the model told us that the most important factors were the amount of lights on, the amount of migration occurring, and specifically the amount of wind blowing from the west. And I can get into that in a bit more detail. Um, we did some additional analyses to provide some additional confidence that the association between lighting and collisions wasn't just a correlation, but really reflected a 
a true causal relationship with with bird strikes. Um, yeah, and, and we found that there was a, you know, a much higher risk for collisions when, when the radar measured more birds migrating over Chicago, when more lights were turned on in the building, um, and when winds were blowing from the west towards the east. Um, and that makes sense because Chicago is on the uh, western shore of Lake Michigan, and winds blowing from the west are likely to um, push migrating birds closer to the lake and likely to have them concentrate in number uh, along the lake shore, lake shore over Chicago, um, which probably is, is why that particular scenario leads to more bird collisions. Sure. So uh, could you expand a bit more on why it's uh, specifically wind from the west um, that's significant? Sure. So b- birds... Um, Birds are typically migrating so in, in the fall. They're migrating south um, from breeding areas across North America. Many of them are coming from the northern forests, the boreal forests in Canada. Um, they're migrating south. And winds have a very important effect on, on migrating birds. Uh, if the winds are unfavorable, if they're, say, blowing against their direction of, of travel, the, a headwind, in other words, they often won't migrate that particular night. Um, but if winds are, are from behind are pushing them onwards, they will they will migrate in large numbers. And winds from either side, from the east or west, um, may push birds somewhat off course or, or, have, or result in them adjusting their course. And in this particular case, um, the, sh- the Lake Michigan uh, is oriented more or less north-south. So it, it runs north-south and, and the shore of the lake runs north-south. And Chicago is situated right on that north-south oriented lakeshore. And the result of that is that if winds are blowing from the west, all the birds that are migrating either south or north are likely to be pushed towards the lakeshore. All the birds to the west of the lake are likely to be pushed towards the lake. And if you're a small migrating bird, often um, you don't like to migrate over big expanses of open water. So if a bird sees itself being, um, or finds itself being pushed, drifted towards open water, they'll often uh, reorient or or change course to to try and stay over land. And so that will result in a lot of them um, concentrating or occurring in larger numbers along the coast instead of out over the water. Um, so this is one possible explanation for why these westerly winds um, are leading to more bird collisions, because in those conditions, more we think more birds are likely to be concentrating in the air over Chicago because it's right along that lakeshore. So so on the topic of these um, these western winds that are leading to more um, uh, bird collisions, what other factors, uh, so factors other than light pollution, lead to these fatal bird collisions? Well, we focused on collisions occurring during uh, nocturnal migration um, because that is when light pollution is, is having a big influence. Um, but collisions also occur in the daytime and often in large numbers as well. Um, but the uh, it, it's a little bit of a different phenomenon. So in that case, we think that glass reflection um, is likely to be you know, the, the most important factor instead of of light pollution. Um, so specifically, uh, birds may see the sky or trees or habitat reflected in the glass during the daytime and think that it, glass is actually open sky or or a tree and and fly towards the glass and and collide with it. So treatment of bird safe glass treatment um, that breaks up the reflection is likely to be effective during the daytime uh, to prevent those kinds of of bird collisions, the ones that occur in the daytime. Um, But it's a little bit unclear whether this kind of glass treatment makes a difference for nocturnal collisions, which which is what we studied. Um, So that's one one additional component um, to bird collisions. So when when we have these, uh, when we have light pollution, we can just turn off the light, right? Um, that's a potential way to to reduce that effect. Um, you you spoke to how you, you can bird proof um, uh, 
the the glass are there any other solutions um to these alternative causes of fatal bird bird collisions thankfully i think the the solution as as you mentioned at least to to nocturnal collisions is, is relatively simple and that's to turn out unnecessary lights uh, and there are a number of lights out initiatives across north america um including in chicago where we studied um collisions specifically but these are all across north america and these, these programs encourage buildings, uh, especially those in urban areas, to turn off their lights when, when birds are migrating. Um, of course, more pe- it would be great if, if more people um, became involved in those programs, uh, more buildings signed on and, and turned off their lights. So specifically, we, we recommend um, for those that are interested in, in, in taking this kind of action to turn off non-essential lights from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. during Critical migration periods. This is um, the period periods from depending on your location, but uh, we're talking um, generally later in April to the month of May in spring, and from mid August to the end of October or so in 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 fall. But it, it depends a little bit on your location um, when the the peak time of migration is. Um, but turning off lights. Um, Closing window blinds um, is one way one can can reduce the amount of light or eliminate light being leaking to the outside, which is really through the window, which is really um, what makes the biggest difference or, or causes the uh, the negative impacts in, in this case. So simply preventing the light from getting to the outside is another way to make a difference without actually having to turn the lights off. Um, and then there are other types of lights, exterior lights outside landscape lights um and also lights can be aimed downward and and shielded so less of the light escapes out into the uh, up into the sky and is is pointed more completely downwards um for daytime collisions the solutions are are well documented and as we've been discussing um they center around treating glass to to break up a reflection so it's really um simple in in principle um to make a difference here uh, sure. So h- how did you become interested in examining these factors? Um, what was the impetus for your study? You also mentioned um, to me how your your uh, experience in your high school's research program sort of influenced um, your current research interest. How does that tie in with the study? Yeah, so I've, I've personally been interested in birds for, for many years, uh, since I was about, I think, eight, eight years old. <laughs> um, and I got interested in, in studying migratory birds in high school. Um, my, my high school had a, a science research program. I was very fortunate to have that opportunity because um, it clearly has had a big impact on me. Um, and during that program, I reached out and, to a scientist and, and was able to get my feet wet um, in some bird migration research and then um, followed that through when I went to college and, and um, I earned my PhD last year. So, and now I'm working as a, essentially a researcher, a postdoctoral researcher. Um, for this particular study, a, a major focus of, of my work um, has been using radars to study migration, as I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and so I began working on this particular project because um, an open question was to understand how the number of birds migrating overhead on a particular night, which the radar can tell us, relates to the amount of birds that that collide that hadn't been extensively studied. Um, so that's how I became involved in, in this research. But uh, the project as a whole uh, has been going for, for decades. As I mentioned, Dave Willard at the Field Museum has been monitoring this building since 1978. Um, you know, the only reason we can do these analyses and, and have the insights that we have today um, that I've been talking about is because of his long-term commitment over many years um, to collect the data. So that's, I think, an important thing to remember, a nice lesson that, um, you know, collecting data for a long period of time um, is often one of the most valuable ways to, to do science, even um, if it takes a while for it to to ultimately be, be used. Sure. So... I, I guess a bit a uh, bit more of a personal question now. Um, what's your favorite kind of bird? 
Uh, that, 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 that's also a difficult question for me. Uh, but one, one bird that I really um, enjoy is the the Blackburnian warbler, which is a, a small bird, um, you know, about four inches long. I think probably weighs about 10, 10 grams or so. So you know, about as much as a pencil. Um, has a fiery orange throat, jet black and white um, upper parts on the on the back, and um, they have a very high pitched song, which I've always enjoyed um, listening to. Um, so I, I really enjoy them, especially when they come back in the spring, and um, it's just a, a burst of color. This this really bright orange that that you can see in the treetops. Yeah. Um, so uh, finally. You, you touched upon this a bit earlier, but what policy changes um, do you hope are inspired by this study? Yeah, there, there have been um, there have been an encouraging has been an encouraging increase in, in awareness of, of um, the need for for lights out initiatives recently. Um, but lights out programs have been going on for quite a while. The um, the lights out Chicago program is one of the longest running in in North America. Um, but we're seeing some encouraging increases just this year. So, for example, in, in the spring, uh, several cities in Texas, including Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth, um, they, they issued lights out proclamations, um, or their mayors did, for, for the spring migration, encouraging um, buildings to, to turn off lighting during that period. Um, and at the, the state and the municipality level, there, there is some legislation that has been um, proposed and, and passed. Um, for example, actually just about a week or two weeks ago in Illinois, um, they passed a, a Bird Safe Building Act, um, which provides guidelines and requirements for um, for glass, bird safe glass, um, and, and outdoor lighting. Um, it would be great to see more legislation like this um, and more legislation specifically focused on um, indoor lighting for example, the the Illinois Act, I believe, didn't focus very much on on indoor lighting, although you know our study shows that that can be um, that can have a real real negative impact. Um, so I, I hope that that will be reflected in, in updates to existing guidelines and new legislation. Um, but I think a combination of, of legislative action and um, you know just everyday everyday people turning off lights um, hopefully will make a difference. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Van Doren. Those are basically all of the questions that I had. Um, it was an honor talking to you on the podcast. I've had a great time, Vishnu. Thanks for having me.